Hi, this is Serato from Clockwork Butterfly and finally I'm making another tutorial. It has taken a while, I know, and I'm sorry about that, but in the meantime I discovered a possibility to maybe uh, significantly lower the costs of molding and casting dolls, molding specifically, and I couldn't just continue with my tutorials without making sure uh, that the information I was providing was right. So that's it, that's what I've been doing. Aside from that, I have been working on my own dolls, so they will be coming out soon. And at the end of this video, I think I will show you a little preview of that. So, this tutorial is going to be about vocabulary. Now, this doesn't sound like something that's actually important in molding and casting your dolls, but it is because uh, knowing all the right words and terms is crucial if you want to buy silicone or resin or simply if you want to ask questions or if you're using a uh, casting company services and you want to actually d discuss anything with them. Uh, furthermore, uh, I will be getting into a little bit of detail about uh, some techniques and other things and, and tell you what they are and how they work. And the reason I'm doing this tutorial at this point is that if I had done it at the beginning, uh, it would have just been a bunch of terms and words for you which probably wouldn't make much sense and at this point after the first two, two tutorials if there was something you didn't understand uh, in them or didn't know then hopefully uh, watching this video will be like oh so that's what it was and this way you will be you will be able to remember it easier and if there's something in here uh, that you don't know about yet, then it's going to be covered in uh, the upcoming tutorials. And yeah, I think I think we can get to it now. Uh, yeah, let's start. So uh, first of all, mold. A mold is the form used to reproduce an item. This is the thing you pour resin into in order to get something out of it. And uh, the process of mold making, uh, this, is, this is an area which, uh, alongside casting, uh, I see a lot of people making uh, mistakes in here. And uh, as long as we all can communicate, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, how you say things and uh, I definitely don't go around correcting people on on this but it's really good to know uh, because uh, it allows you to just avoid uh, a bunch of um, misunderstandings and mistakes when dealing with other people who do th these things so it's good to know and hopefully it will be helpful for you so uh, you can say that you are molding things, like I'm molding a doll, and that's it, that's just a regular verb, nothing fancy about it, nothing weird. Uh, you can also say that you're making molds, that's kind of obvious, and if, you, uh, if you're talking about a specific part, uh, you will say that you are taking molds off of this thing. Uh, which is uh, less often used, but you may come across this expression. Uh, now, a cast is a copy of something, an item, created in a mold uh, by the method of pouring resin into it. Uh, it wouldn't be a cast if it was made of a semi-solid material. It's a cast because you're pouring things. And... Uh, okay, uh, now, uh, there are many different kinds of resin. Uh, the, the resin you will be making casts of 
is called a pouring resin. Technically, if you want to be uh, very particular about it, you would say that you are pouring a pouring resin, which doesn't make any sense. So you just don't say it. If you're pouring it, then obviously it's this kind of resin, not any other. And uh, the act of creating casts is called casting. And uh, please don't uh, mistake molding and casting. Another thing is uh, casting uh, does not have uh, any other past tense. If you want to say you did it, you did it, you just say you cast something, not casted. I've seen some people say that and <laughs> that's just not working. And... Okay. Uh, otherwise, if you don't want to say you're casting things, you can say you're pouring resin. Uh, usually you don't go just pouring resin all over the place, so if you say you're pouring it, then everyone will understand that you're pouring it into molds and casting things, not just pouring it somewhere. So it's okay to say it that, that way. Uh, master is what the model you're copying is called. Uh, there can be a switch in what is your master, like if you had an unfinished doll in clay, for example, and you made a copy in resin and then you refine that copy and you want to take further copies of that copy, then this resin copy is now your master, not the previous one, because that's the one you will be making molds of, right? Okay, uh, now a little bit of uh, terms uh, for parts of molds and things. A sprue is a hole in the mold where you pour resin into. Now I'll show you, this is my trusty example mold. Not this, this is a frog. This is my, I'm drawing doll hair with it. Okay, this is my trusty example mold. This is where I pour resin into because this is the widest hole and this is called the sprue. Now, uh, the word is also used to refer to the part of resin that solidifies inside this. So when you pull the cast out, it won't be all pretty and refined. It will have a little bit of resin sticking out here and that's also sometimes called a sprue. I'll show you a cast that is not refined so that I can show you where the sprue is. Now, uh, here the difference is pretty small, but this and this, these are additional bits that once I refine this thing, I will be getting rid of them. And if I can see correctly, this one. This is a sprue. Okay, now vents. Uh, venting a mold is a very, very, very important subject and we'll be talking about it a lot. And I really mean a lot. That's This is what makes or breaks a mold. This, uh, this is the difference between a good mold and a bad one is the quality of venting. Now vents, as the name implies really, uh, are additional holes besides the sprue uh, that are there so that the air can escape. When you're pouring, say if you had one hole, like if you're filling a bottle, say if you're pouring and the stream of water takes up the whole neck of the bottle, you'll get some air trapped inside there. So a vent allows it to escape so that you can fill the whole thing. These, and this thing, these two are vents. They're huge because this is not a refined mold and uh, I tend to try to save on costs when I make uh, molds that are not uh, the final thing. Uh, and for that reason I fill my resin which makes it thicker so I need wider things and that's okay for me because I'm 
gonna be doing a lot of refining there anyway. And as we looked at this, it's a different one, but whatever. So again, this is the sprue, this is the vent. This is where the air was escaping. Now, uh, to illustrate what happens if you don't vent your molds properly, uh, here's a miscast. Uh, this one was uh, uh, happened for a different reason, I just didn't put enough resin into it. Uh, just ran out of it, I think. Uh, so, this doesn't look the way uh, it would in detail, but the general pr principle is that I was pouring the resin he through here and then it didn't reach up here because here it would have had to flow upwards which, you know, fluids don't do that, nothing really goes upwards because gravity, right? So, this is where the air was trapped so the resin didn't get there, and so we get a missing piece. Uh, <clears throat> again, another thing is, uh, once you've poured it, uh, the resin will also uh, release some bubbles. Hopefully uh, you don't have many, uh, ideally you don't have any, but in reality there will be some bubbles and they will uh, escape as the resin sets, it will slowly release them and you want to have a, a path for them to escape. So that's another reason why you have vents. Uh, then we get to the additives. I talked about them in both previous tutorials, so I'm basic basically repeating myself here, but uh, an additive is some kind of substance that you add to some other substance to alter its uh, properties. And that's basically the only universal thing about additives because uh, typically every company will have their own names uh, for every kind of additive and not every company has the same kinds of additives available. So there are no rules here, whatever the company makes, uh, that's what avail what's available to you. Uh, generally, uh, as long as the type of substance, resin or silicone, is the same, uh, the additives should be compatible between companies, uh, but that's not necessarily so, so better ask uh, beforehand if something will work for you or not. Uh, anyways, the one thing that does have a fairly common name, uh, or at least the word will be somehow in incorporated into the name, is the th thixotropic additive. And we're running out of video time. And we're back. For whatever reason, I still haven't figured out why this camera uh, shuts, uh, sh turns recording off after 13 win minutes, approximately. But it does. Whatever. Um, uh, what I was at was the six. See, I can't say it. It's a, it's a difficult word. Uh, the thixotropic uh, additive, which is the one that uh, increases the viscosity of the substance. Uh, most typically it will be used for uh, silicones, but you can do that with resins too. Um, basically, in simpler words, it turns a runny liquid into a thick liquid or even into a paste. And this is useful for, uh, say, I had a sculpture uh, or something on the wall that I wanted to copy and I can't take it off. I can't just move it and put it somewhere so that I can pour silicone over it. So instead I make my silicone thicker uh, and this way I can spread it over the thing and it won't run down and off the thing. Uh, I think it's logical here, uh, you're not really going to be using that for dolls, because dolls are made of parts that are relatively small. Relatively. I'm working on a 69 centimeter now, so <laughs> relatively. But yeah, generally it's stuff you can lift, you can move it, so you don't have to worry about this particular thing. Uh, yeah, 
Another thing we've been over before are the names of different parts of different substances. Uh, as I said in the previous tutorials, for silicone uh, you will typically have a big amount of one thing and a relatively small amount of the other thing. And the first thing is just called silicone, that, that the silicone. And then there is a second part, uh, which is the catalyst. And that's it. You mix them usually a lot of silicone to a little bit of uh, catalyst. Uh, in resins, it's uh, the resin and the hardener. And there's typically s around sort of more or less equal amounts of both. There can be a uh, one to one re mixing ratio, like with my resin, car my current resin, uh, or uh, 70 to 30, 60 40, something like that. Generally, there will be more or less the same amount. And a lot of companies, uh, instead of using those names, just call the two parts A and B. And that, that's okay, that's up to them. Uh, usually part A is the thing, the resin or silicone, and, the, and part B is the additive thing, so catalyst or hardener. Now, uh, catalyst is the thing that is added to liquid silicone uh, to initiate the chemical reaction which will turn it into a semi-rigid rubber. I showed you what it looks like before, so you should know that. And hardener is the thing that is added to liquid resin in order to start the chemical reaction that will turn it rigid, usually. Now, uh, with both of these things, uh, the thing they turn into is a typical situation and the one you will encounter when working on dolls, because uh, Silicones can can have a different uh, degrees of rigidity. They can be more flexible, less flexible, softer, harder. And uh, resins, uh, with resins there's a whole lot of things. They can be flexible, they can be uh, harder or softer. And another thing is they can be bubbly on purpose. Uh, this is how you create uh, sponge-like items like stress balls. Uh, stress balls are basically something like that. There's a kind of plastic that's soft and uh, it's not... Uh, it's a low density uh, thing. So, yeah. Uh, now, uh, some new things. Degassing. Uh, I briefly touched on that with the uh, vents thing. Degassing is the process of leaving uh, your silicone or resin alone to do its thing. That's in practice. You just you just leave it alone, let it sit. Uh, obviously, you're only going to be able to do that uh, just like that with things that are uh, slow setting, because if something wants to set faster, then likely you won't have time to just let it sit before you pour it. Uh, but basically... Uh, Mixing uh, silicone or resin will always introduce some amount of bubbles and uh, you want to let them escape before you pour. So, uh, provided you have time for that, you just set the mixture aside for hopefully about 10 minutes, sometimes, sometimes half an hour, but that's uh, with extremely uh, slow setting things. And the bubbles just rise to the top and escape. And that's it. That, that, that's the thing that does itself, in a way. Uh, now, as I said, uh, you can't do it if you have a fast-setting resin or silicone, uh, because by the time it's degassed, it will all, already be, be solid. So, there are vacuum chambers. Now, a vacuum chamber is a device that is made mainly of two components. One is the chamber itself, so uh, a kind of airtight container that is made of uh, very strong materials. And uh, the second part is some kind of pump that takes the air out, thus creating a vacuum in the chamber. Uh, it's uh, the most efficient and easiest way of degassing and because it's so fast it allows you to uh, degas even fast setting things. 
and basically the way it happens is that uh, lower pressure makes all the bubbles rise faster and it kind of looks like it's boiling. It's it's a really in interesting thing to look to look at. You can you look up uh, some videos on YouTube. Mm. Yeah, just just search for uh, vacuum chamber silicone or resin. Uh, it happens really fast. The bubbles just go up and they're gone, pretty much. Uh, uh, now uh, another thing that's sort of related is pressure casting. Uh, instead of using a vacuum chamber, you can put uh, your casts, aka after pouring resin into the mold, you then put it in another device uh, that is uh, creating high pressure. And uh, this also helps eliminate any bubbles that might have survived your previous treat treatment. Uh, the way it happens is uh, as everything is under pressure, uh, the bubbles get compressed to the point where they're virtually non existent because you know it's easier to squeeze air than resin, so there's still relatively the same am amount of resin, and the bubbles are just squeezed squished and they're so tiny you can see them. Uh, usually you're going to use uh, a separate pressure chamber, pressure pot also called, usually that's referred to as pressure pot, uh, but a sort of low budget version is injection casting. Uh, this has uh, many benefits, uh, but it's also pretty tricky. Uh, if you don't get it right, it will actually introduce bubbles because, uh, you know, if you squirt resin out of a syringe uh, at a high pressure, it just it's just gonna bubble, just like you, it, it would happen with coke or something like that. There are bubbles there, but they're a limited amount, and then if you shake it, suddenly there's nothing but bubbles and that's kind of what happens uh, with resin if you do injection casting wrong uh, but if you do it right uh, it will uh, first of all allow uh, for fewer bubbles and fewer uh, hollow spaces like this uh, because the pressure will push out the air that would otherwise just sit there. As long as there is a vent and it's physically possible for the air to escape, it's going to escape uh, easier. It'll be more likely to escape uh, if you apply some pressure there, other than just uh, counting on the weight of the resin to push it out. Uh, another benefit is uh, the fact that it uh, allows you to work faster. Uh, this is especially uh, important with fast setting resins. Uh, and normally if you're just sitting there and pouring it, uh, you're going to have time for one mold. And s sometimes even that is tricky. Uh, bef because uh, the resin starts to uh, solidify before uh, you're done pouring. And with injection casting, uh, you're done within seconds if you do if you do it right, and then you can move on to the next mold and the next one and the next one. So uh, you can mix up bigger batches of resin uh, and not waste it, and the whole process just becomes faster and easier for you. Uh, now, another uh, sort of low budget uh, option: uh, if you don't have a vacuum chamber, uh, and even if you do, because you know it doesn't hurt. Uh, there is the high pour. The high pour is a met method of pouring silicone or, or resin uh, in such a way that you uh, break up the bu bubbles and avoid introducing new ones. And uh, the way it is done, it's very simple in principle. It just takes a little bit of getting used to, to, to actually do it right. Uh, you just pour from as high as possible and in a very thin, very as thin as, as you can, 
and very slow and steady stream. Now, obviously, <laughs> it's not really a thing when you're in a hurry with resin. Uh, it's definitely uh, going to work much better with uh, silicone that's typically a longer setting time. If your resin allows for that, though, then it's also helpful. Uh, now, uh, rigid mold. Uh, any mold that is not, fa not not flexible is called a rigid mold, and they're typically made of uh, things like plaster. And uh, there are downsides. There are also positives. Uh, they are uh, traditionally used for materials such as uh, po porcelain. Uh, if you see porcelain BJDs, they're probably cast in uh, plaster molds. And uh, uh, they are much, much cheaper, like insanely so. And we're approaching another 30 minute mark. This is long. Back, I'm probably gonna, going to uh, put this into two parts or something. Um, yeah, rigid molds. Uh, they're extremely cheap, but uh, because they are rigid, they don't allow you to uh, copy parts that are overly complicated, and by overly complicated, I mean complicated at all. Uh, for example, uh, you're probably not going to be able to cast uh, things like chest parts. This would be very tricky with a rigid mold. Um, I mean, of course, people who make porcelain dolls uh, are doing that. Uh, it's just uh, a lot, a lot more uh, difficult and the mold design has to be perfect because there can't be any undercuts, not even a single one because then uh, the cast will be st stuck in the mold forever or for that matter the master will be stuck there so you won't even get to use the mold. Uh, now what an undercut is, is uh, generally a place where some part of the mold reaches in a way behind the object uh, so that in order to take the object out you have to bend the mold. Now I think I have a little bit of an undercut here. Here you go. There's a little bit of a lip here. So if I wanted to just... If this was rigid and I wanted to just pull the part it will be stuck on this and because the mold is flexible I can just open it up and pull it out. Uh, there's a second thing about undercuts now the, because this is something you can using silicone just fixes and no problem I just I just squeeze it open and it worked perfectly. But there's another reason why you should avoid undercuts in all situations and that is uh, the fact that if this, instead of just sort of, you know, slightly hanging here just a little bit, if this was any, uh, uh, any longer, then while I was pouring, this was poured this way, while I was pouring air would be trapped here. So the silicone wouldn't get all the way in there, so the mold wouldn't work, basically. It, would, uh, it wouldn't copy my item perfectly. So you still have to uh, watch out for undercuts in all kinds of molds. Uh,